Thank you, Mr. Becker. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. I'll, talking about, I'll talk about AI, but I'll talk about a problem that sounds a bit boring about safety. But I'll, I'll try to convince you that it's really fascinating. It's not only fascinating if we don't solve this problem and what, what I'll propose is kind of a starting point to solve this problem. If you don't solve this problem, I don't see an industry of autonomous cars. Okay. So let's, let's start with a, a short clip just to give context. So, so the context I want to build, say, in the first 10 minutes is the motivation. Why are we solving the problem that I want to show you? Okay. Just before we get into, get into the details. So it all started at the last uh, CES, so January this year, we built a fully autonomous car together with Delphi that drove for a route of about 10 kilometers inside the city of Las Vegas. You know, very, very challenging uh, maneuvers. It did about 300 rounds a day for four days, day and night, and it was really perfect, made no, made no mistake. You know, people who sat in the car, reporters, customers, that they, they came to us and say, this is the best demonstration that we have seen. So first, let, let me show you the, the clip. This, this clip is by one of the reporters, and then I'll explain why I'm showing you this clip. I'm here at CES, where I've just taken a ride in the latest version of Delphi's autonomous research vehicle. This is an Audi SQ5 that Delphi has fitted with radar, LiDAR, and what's new for this generation is a camera system from partner Mobileye. That means nine cameras around the vehicle that give this car a better sense of its surroundings. During the drive on a set route, this car acted very naturally. It was aggressive enough, but safe enough. It felt like a human was behind the wheel. There's a display in the car that showed me what the car was seeing. I could see when it could see pedestrians, crosswalks, traffic lights. It really had a great sense of its surroundings. One thing that really impressed me is while we were in a left turn lane, another car cut in front of us and the Delphi car behaved perfectly. Another time we also went through a fairly long tunnel, the car lost its GPS connection but still stayed on course. And one final thing that really impressed me is that this car uses crowdsourcing to determine its path down the road. It sees the path that similarly equipped cars have taken before it and so it follows that path as well as lane lines. So at that point it dawned on me that from a demonstration perspective, we are there with the big guys. Now, Google, Uber, GM, all those companies that are showing you know, advanced uh, demonstration of a car driving autonomously and in city traffic. But then I told myself, this is not ready for production. Right? This is, there's no way to build a, a business around it. This, this is really a science project. And the question is, is, what do we need to do in order to move from a science project into mass production? And there are certain industries, like in pharmaceuticals, where you reach a point which is called the valley of death. You have, you have a drug tested on mice, it works, and then, then you have this huge abyss, this huge valley of death, phase one, phase two, phase three, and most likely the chances of it passing through all these stages is very, very small, and eventually you, don't, you do not succeed. So these kinds of demonstrations, from, from my perspective, it's, it's a science project. How do we go from there to, to mass uh, production? Because before we start investing billions of dollars, I need to make sure that we know what we are doing. Yeah, because Mobileye was always about building a business. It's not you know, a research uh, institute. We're building a business, we were very successful in building a business of driving assist, and we want to make sure that we'll be successful in building a business of autonomous driving. And therefore, answering this question became, became an obsession of mine for a, number, for a number of months. And there were two, two elements that we identified that are missing. One is, is about economic scalability. That, that there is kind of a, a sense of brute force, brute force in terms of the amount of silicon that you need to do, the, the, the cost of the sensors, the cost of the computing, the cost of building maps that are all good for demonstration, but it's not good for, for building a business. This is one thing. I'm not going to talk about that today. The second is about safety. And then when we, told, when we thought about uh, uh, safety, we told ourselves, you know, these cars, they should negotiate in traffic like humans, because if you don't act like a human, you'll start obstructing traffic. If you're too conservative, you drive too, too slowly, 
you are very, very cautious in, in maneuvering, and the city is dense with other, with other cars, you'll simply get stuck and not move, and, and no city will want you driving in their city. It's, it's one thing that you have one or two cars like this, but you have 10,000 cars blocking a city. So on one hand, you want human-level negotiation. On the other hand, what about accidents? Right? We don't want accidents. But you know, if there are few accidents, then what do we do? Who, who is liable for all of this? Then we told ourselves, well, well th th this, this is a big issue. It is an issue that could really kill the industry, and I'll explain why it can kill the industry. And, and what I'm going to explain is we published, after six months of work, we published a, a scientific, a very mathematical uh, paper about safety. And again, safety sounds like a boring thing. My goal in the next 20 minutes is to convince you it's really, it's really fascinating. And, and, I'll, and I'll try to explain what, what, what is behind it. So, so the first thing that we ask ourselves, if there's an accident, what are the alternatives today? And uh, I, I see two alternatives, and both of them are very bad. The first alternative, the manufacturer of the AV car goes to court and is being treated just like a human. So when we go to court, our interpretation of traffic laws are being questioned. Our actions are being questioned. You know, uh, I did a lane change. The prosecutor would claim that my lane change was reckless. I would claim that it was not reckless. The prosecutor would claim that I misjudged the understanding of the other uh, drivers, I would claim that I did not misjudge them, and, and back and forth, back and forth. This is, this is bad, because we are now in front of jurors and lawyers and judges, each one has their own biases. And you know, an accident, especially a fatality between a machine and a human, it's just like a man biting dog. That's a rare event. Dog biting man is, happens all the time, but the other one, so it will create a lot, a lot of media attention and it could kill the, could kill the industry. So th this is a bad alternative. The second alternative is also bad. Second alternative, I'll come to court, and I'll say, look, unfortunate things happen, but my technology is the best. All elements of my technologies, the number of sensors, the amount of computing, the amount of simulations, I've run billions of kilometers of simulations, the amount of validation and real driving. I've driven the largest number, the largest number of kilometers. You will not find any competitor on any aspect of the technology that is better than me. Okay, therefore, now somebody died, somebody died. Okay, but no, I've, I, I'm, I'm the best. Why is this bad? Because it leads to an over-engineering, over-engineered uh, solution. If my competitor added the sensor, even if that sensor doesn't do anything, Right? because I'm thinking what will happen when I come to court, then I'll also add another sensor. So we're creating an over-engineered solution, and we're not solving the problem. We're not really guaranteeing safety. We're just protecting ourselves against uh, liability. We're not doing anything that is really guaranteed to solving a real problem, which is how do I, I guarantee uh, safety? So... Um, so we took inspiration for today, how, how AEB, Autonomous Emergency Braking and Driving Assist, is being tested. And that there's something interesting about how it is being tested. So when you think about AEB, the car is braking before an accident, applies the brakes before an accident, you need to reach a balance of false negatives and false positives. So false negatives is the probability that you missed the target, you were supposed to apply the brakes, but you didn't apply the brakes. And false positives is that there was a false actuation. You are not supposed to apply the brakes, and you applied the brakes. The regulator tested, tested, tests only the false negatives. They create a test track. In the test track, they'll have vehicles, they'll have pedestrians, and your car needs to drive towards the vehicles and pedestrians and apply the brakes, and you are being tested whether the car actually does what it's supposed to do. The regulator does not test false positives. The question is why, and there are two reasons. One, it's very, very difficult to test false positives. You cannot test false positive on a test track. You need to collect a lot, a lot of data covering day, night, dusk, different geographies, weather conditions, blah, 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 blah. It's very difficult to test false positives. Second, there's no need to test false positives because the assumption is that the car manufacturer would want to reduce the false positives, otherwise the customer will complain. Right? If I'm driving leisurely and all of a sudden my car breaks, then I'll be scared. I'll take the car back to the dealership. I'll say, I don't want anything to do with this car. 
And, and the car manufacturer, that's the interest of the car manufacturer to make sure that the level of false positives is very, very low. So the regulator needs only to test that the system is doing something, which is the false negatives. Okay? So now the question is, how do we take this inspiration and map it onto how do you go and test autonomous cars? Okay? There should be something that the regulator does, and there should be something that is on the responsibility of the manufacturer, just like with the false negatives uh, false positives. So, when we look at what causes an accident, I would say that there are two sources. One, I would call it sensing mistakes. I have sensors, and these sensors did not interpret the environment correctly. There was a vehicle, they missed the vehicle, or they have a wrong measurement of the vehicle, and this sensing mistake was responsible for the accident. There was a vehicle there, I didn't see it, and I hit the vehicle. Let's call that a sensing mistake. Not all, not all sensing mistakes lead to an accident, but some, but some do. I would say later that this part is, is the easy part. Then another source of mistakes is miscalculating planning decisions. I decided to change lane, I changed lane in a reckless manner, and because of that there was an accident. Okay? And, and this is where I want to focus, and, and there's a good reason why I want to focus on, on that. Um, Let's see what is first the traditional wisdom. The traditional wisdom is that you do sensing and planning together. You conflate them. You try to do an end-to-end -end, uh, validation. And the end-to-end -end validation is basically statistically driven. The more kilometers I drive, and in those kilometers I have no accidents, the, more, the higher the maturity of the system is. And if you go, for example, to Waymo's website, they'll say, we have driven 4 million kilometers, and you know, we are good. We have driven 4 million kilometers. And maybe their competitor will come and say, later, we have driven 5 million kilometers, then, then, we are, then we are better. So the first thing that I need to convince you why this is wrong. Why not simply use this approach, drive more, as much kilometers as, as, as you can, and use that to validate the system. So don't separate sensing from planning. It's a mistake. Just drive enough number of kilometers and try to flush out all these mistakes and then, and then show that you know, the probability of a mistake is very, very small to an acceptable uh, level. So we can do the following thought experiment to see how ridiculous uh, this is. So the follow this thought experiment is let's take human driving. There are known statistics about human driving. One of them is that the probability of a fatality of somebody getting killed in an accident per one hour of driving is around one to a million. Okay, now one to a million sounds, sounds good, but let's see what, what it means. Let's take in the U.S. The U.S. are about 35,000 people getting killed every year with accidents. Now, clearly, if we come to society and say we're going to replace humans with machines, and machines are going to kill 35,000 people, it's not going to work, right? But even if we do it 10,000 people, that's, again, not, not going to be accepted. There has to be a huge gap. It has to be three orders of magnitude going from 35,000 to 35, that, that can work. So we're talking about, we need to build a system in which we can guarantee a probability of a fatality per one hour of driving to one to a billion, 10 to the minus nine. Now, in machine learning, one can prove bounds. And one can prove the following bound, that if you have an event per an hour of driving at a probability p, the amount of data that you need to collect in order to validate is 1 over p. So if we're talking about 10 to the minus 9 probability, we need to collect 10 to the power of 9 hour of driving. 10 to the, let's assume an hour of driving is about 30 kilometers, so we're talking about 30 billion kilometers. So these are not the 4, four million kilometers that we see, it is 30 billion. 30 billion is not, is not feasible. I have a slide showing the cost and so forth, it's about $2 trillion, and it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not possible, okay? So, so this statistical approach, by looking at just what is the probability of making a mistake that will create a fatality just by collecting data, is not, is not, is, is not feasible. So what are we proposing? So we're proposing first we decouple sensing and planning. Regarding with sensing, one can show a claim that if we have three sensor modalities, the amount of data that we need to collect for this probability p is 1 over square root of p, which means an upper bound of about 100,000 hours of driving, which is about 3 million kilometers. 3 million kilometers 
is, is reasonable to, uh, to collect. And if, if you can do a more thorough study that we do together with our OEM partners, you know, this is an upper bound, probably you can do much less than 100,000 hours of driving. So this is just to validate the probability of a sensing mistake. When we come to planning mistakes, what we want to do here is to provide a guarantee. We're not talking about something statistical, but a, a, a guarantee that our planning decisions, our decisions, our, our actions will never create our autonomous vehicle to create an accident of its blame. And the question is whether this can be done. And the point is, yes, this can be done. But it's not data driven. It's not just by, by collecting uh, kilometers. It's by building a model. And what that model is, we're, we're doing something that would either sound trivial or too difficult, depending on, on, your, on your philosophy. What we are trying to do here is formalize human judgment, formalize the human judgment of the common sense of, of driving. And we claim it can be done. First, we claim it's difficult, and it, it, it can be done. And use that in a way, and use that in order to guarantee, not in a statistical sense, in absolute sense, that you'll never create, you'll never create a planning decision that will create an accident of your blame, and you'll still be, ne still be able to negotiate like a human driver. So, um, so the first, when you start thinking about it, that you know, safety is now model-based. It is not a statistical-based. So I'm talking about artificial intelligence. This is old-school artificial intelligence. Today, when you say artificial intelligence today, what you mean is deep learning. You mean machine learning. You mean data-driven processes. Because rule-based artificial intelligence, which was back in the 70s, 80s, failed. We'll not be able to do complicated things by defining rules to do those complicated things. Even detecting a face in an image by, by a rule-based approach, you know, scientists fail to do it. And this is why machine learning came to the rescue. But for doing safety, I'm going back to old school artificial intelligence. It's really understanding human judgment and creating a formal model of human judgment. A rule-based formal model of human judgment. Okay, so it's old school artificial intelligence, and I'm claiming that, I'm claiming that this, is, this is necessary because the data-driven approach, the amount of kilometers you'll need to collect is unfeasible. Second, this black box approach would, would create a backlash from society because if you, God forbid, killed someone, you need to explain why. You cannot say this was a black box validated over 30 billion kilometers and you know, it killed him, I don't know why. It has to be a model, it has to be interpretable and, and explainable. But then we said well, that absolute safety is not possible. I cannot guarantee there'll never be an accident. Take, for example, this, this example, let's assume that I'm, I'm the center vehicle here, I'm trapped. If this vehicle now starts hitting me here, uh, there's no way to escape. So I cannot, I cannot guarantee absolute safety, but what I guarantee is that I'll never be responsible for an accident that whatever I do will not create an accident of my blame. And now we need to define what the blame is. We need to define this in, in a formal manner. And, and, and these kinds of things are missing today. If you look at traffic laws, traffic laws are for humans. It provides guidelines, but it's not precise. There are not precise definitions. For example, ask yourself, is there a precise definition of when a cut-in is reckless or not? You cut in. An accident happened, then you go to court and you start arguing who was responsible and whether it was reckless or not reckless. There's no precise definition. There isn't even a precise definition of who's responsible for the lateral maneuver. Because a cut in is not only you are driving straight and somebody comes from here. Cut in could be something like this. You are moving laterally, the other one is moving laterally. Who's responsible for the lateral maneuver? All these definitions are not there in, in traffic laws. Okay? So what we need to, uh, there are two criteria that we need to develop here. One is soundness. Soundness meaning is that if our model states that the agent, the autonomous car, is not to be blamed, then this should match the common sense of humans. If there is a scenario in which an agent 
was involved in an accident and our model says that this agent is not to be blamed, it has to match common sense. The other way around doesn't need to happen. We can be more conservative if there is kind of a fuzzy situation and we assign blame, even though a human would say, maybe I think it's not, it's not his responsibility, it's okay. Being more conservative is okay. But the other way around cannot happen. Right? We cannot clear the blame when a human judgment says it's not, uh, it is to be blamed. So this is one thing, to create a model that is sound. And then I'll show you how, how, we, how we validate this soundness. The second one is more, more tricky, is usefulness. Usefulness meaning that I can take this model and actually implement it. Right? Because you'll have absolute safety if you don't drive at all. Right? You simply don't, don't drive. Right? Now, why is this tricky? Because you need to, you need to prove that your decision-making is not based on, that does not create a butterfly effect. That means I'm doing an innocent action now, and then the other cars are doing their actions, I'm doing another action, another action, and then there's going to be a catastrophe at the end. Because if that, that is the case, it means it's like playing chess. I need to open up the tree of all possibilities, and that's going to explode exponentially from a, compu from a computing point of view, and that's not, it's not useful. I need to prove that making a local decision, making a decision based on what I see as the present, is sufficient to guarantee, I'm saying guarantee, long-term effects. And this, this is tricky. And so how you build definitions that on one hand match human judgment, on the other hand are useful. You can build an algorithm that you can prove will not create an accident. And, and, and this is, this is what, what we have done. We call this responsibility uh, sensitive safety, uh, uh, RSS. And the idea is first, we set the rules of blame in advance. We create definitions of what does it mean to be blamed? Who is responsible for what? Okay? And then part of this is formalizing the common sense of human judgment. And it's not, it's not formalizing the law because you're allowed to violate traffic laws. For example, if in, in order to escape from an accident, I'm allowed to violate traffic laws. For example, cross a solid line. Right? So it's not, it's not formalizing the law. It's formalizing human judgment. Okay? And then we develop a, a concept of safe state. Safe state meaning that if you are in that position, no matter what other cars do, cars or pedestrians, no matter what they do, you are never going to hit them. This is a safe state. And then a method for verifying that the agent the autonomous vehicle transition only from safe state to safe state. So if you are transitioning only between safe state to safe state, you'll never cause an accident. And here, one needs to prove that this transition is sound. That means you are not creating butterfly, butterfly <coughs> effects. Okay? So, um, so it, it looks like maybe too, too ambitious. So I'll try to give you some intuition uh, behind it. First of all, there are only few common sense rules. It's surprising there are only few common sense rules and all the rest is d derived uh, uh, from it. One, when someone hits you from behind, it's not your fault, but if you perform a reckless cut in and then someone hits you from behind, it is your fault, so. Right of way is given, not taken. This is another uh, principle. And the th fourth one is you have to be careful when you have limited uh, sensing, some, some a child jumping from, from an occlusion boundary. So, uh, if you look at, let's start with very, very simple, safe distance. Right? If, 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 I'm, if I'm the rear vehicle here, I have enough information to calculate, since I'm a machine, I have enough information to calculate what should be the safe distance such that if the car in front breaks with a 1G force, I'll not hit it. Uh, we, we, have all, we, we, we know what's the road conditions, we know our response time because we are a machine, we know what is our braking power. Again, we are a machine, so we can calculate what is the safe distance. And these safe distances are, are reasonable numbers. You know, if we're driving the same speed, it's only five meters. If there's a, a 50 kilometer per hour difference, it's only 30 meters. So these are distances that we humans are even more conservative than, than it. If you're looking about intersection, so one, if you are intersecting into another car's corridor, there is, a, a, you want to make sure that the longitudinal, you have a, a safe distance longitudinal. Then there are all sorts of considerations of lateral velocity and position to determine who is responsible for this maneuver. And it turns out that this is very, very tricky. It's not just 
the lateral velocity, who has the higher lateral velocity, who has the more uh, center position, it is much more trickier uh, uh, than that. So the notion of who's responsible for lateral maneuver requires very, very careful uh, consideration. It's part of our model. In addition, these blame definitions make assumptions. I'll take two, three more minutes. Uh, my time is up. These, uh, these maneuvers make assumptions that we as humans make. For example, when I want to change lane, if I'm assuming that all other vehicles are moving in their same speed, I'll never be able to change lane unless the road is clear. Right? What we humans do, we assume that the car in the next lane will slow down when I'm, when I'm trying to squeeze in. So we are making assumptions about response time, we are making assumptions about what is the braking force, a reasonable braking force, not an emergency braking force, of the car in the next lane. All of these are parameters in the model that needs to be agreed together with uh, uh, regulatory bodies. Then uh, dealing with limited uh, uh, sensing, then dealing with all sorts of what we call uh, route priority, two-way traffic, and so forth and so forth. It turns out that the number of scenarios, the number of principles that you need here are not that big, and you can cover, you can cover something that is sound. And how do we prove that, um, that we covered something that is sound? One moment, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this, just go to the sound. So what we did in order to, to prove to ourselves that this is sound, we took uh, the NHTSA crash typology report. So what NHTSA did, they took six million crashes divided it into 37 scenarios, and they claimed that those 37 scenarios cover 99.4% of the crashes. We took all those scenarios and ran them through our model, and the model agrees with, with, with all of them. So uh, uh, this shows that at least with the data that is available today, the model agrees with, with human intuition, with human uh, judgment. And then there's an algorithm around those definitions that guarantee that we're transitioning from safe state to safe state with formal proofs that there's no butterfly uh, effect. So if you agree with the definitions of what blame is, then the model using those definitions will never cause an accident. And uh, how would then a regulator go and validate autonomous car? Let's go back to the inspiration from, autonom from AEB. I would say that you know, there is a, the, the regulator will certify the planning module of, of the car. So, and the RSS definitions is a good, good point to, to start, a good starting point. And then the cautious commands, these commands that move us from safe state to safe state, the method will be open sourced. This is, this is our uh, intention, so that's available to the entire industry. And then the certification is, the validation is only by simulation. Going over those 37 scenarios or whatever number of scenarios eventually would be compiled and making sure that that particular planning software satisfies the RSS definitions, and the method for doing that is already, will be open sourced and, and published. And this is not data driven. What is left is validation of sensing. And this, we would say, is the responsibility of, of the car manufacturer. Um, and this would be the last slide that I'm putting here. Responsibility of the car manufacturer, because the risk and the probability of making a sensing mistake is something that is calculated, you can calculate, and you know how much mileage you need in order to verify that. In our work, we showed that with three sensor, it's the upper bound is 10 to the power of five hours of driving, three million kilometers. So now it depends on the OEM. If you have big bolts like Tesla, you'll put only cameras. One, there's no, there's no redundancy, okay? And you do your calculations, and you say, okay, this is, this, this is the risk that I'm taking. Because if I'm involved in an accident, and that accident is because of a sensing mistake, I'm liable. If you want to take less risk, you'll put more sensors. You'll create redundancy, but it's your, it's your decision to make. The planning part has been certified. You cannot put a car on the road if the planning part has not been certified, and the, here is the model, the method, all open source. Sensing mistakes, it's your business. You want to be liable, you want to pay a lot of damages, put you know, less redundancy. You want to take less risk, it will be more cost, put more redundancy, right? It's, it's your business, just like the false positives in the AEB case. You want to put a crappy system just to pass the test track, but then it will create a lot of false positives? Be my guest, do it. You'll lose the business very, very quickly. Right? So it's, it's, 
It's the same, it's, it's, it's the same uh, idea. And this is data driven, but we know how to upper bound the amount of data that needs to be, that needs to be done there. Okay? So uh, as, as, as a summary, now unlike empirical models, this is about uh, guarantees. It's not about formalizing the law. It is about formalizing human judgment. Because again, you can violate the law under this model. Okay? And you know, the point is that traffic laws are meant for humans. Machines need formalism. And we can, if we can leverage that in order to solve a very, very difficult problem, which is how do we guarantee safety? Right? Um, and we're talking also about a formal context for ethical uh, dilemmas. This model also, when you talk about ethical dilemmas, it gives you a good context about ethical dilemmas. For example, in our model, if you see an accident coming on you, going to be an accident not of your fault, but still you want to evade the accident, you are allowed to do whatever is possible to do, including violating the law, as long as you don't create another accident. Now, why we don't allow you to create another accident? Because we say that your judgment of what is the severity of an accident is subjective. There could be all sorts of hidden parameters you are not aware of. For example, in the other accident, there is a baby in the back seat, and you don't know that. So therefore, you cannot mitigate one accident with another accident. But let's assume that the regulator comes and says, no, I want to mitigate one accident with another accident under certain conditions. It's possible. It's possible to add this into the model and create what is what we call uh, blame transitivity. If I'm now going to create another accident because I want to evade an accident which is not my fault, the blame would go to the guy who started the chain. We're not allowing it in our model, but it's possible to add it. So it provides a context for, for ethical uh, dilemmas. And of course, all of this requires intimate collaboration with industry players. We already began working intimately with at least five car manufacturers. Some of them are here in the room, representatives of those car manufacturers. Uh, with deep dive uh, workshops, and, and the response is, is you know, 100% embracing of the concept. Because this is a concept that it is clearly not benefiting anyone's technology. It's not a model that we put together in order to benefit our chip, in order to benefit our software, in order to benefit the way we think about cameras versus radars versus ladders. This is, this is a model that is intended to solve a problem which is good for all of us in order to create, to create an, an, an industry. So first, w talking with industry players and then moving to having a conversation with regulatory bodies. And I don't expect an uphill battle there because, again, we're solving a problem which regulators are really looking for answers. And today, they simply don't have the tools for these answers. Therefore, they are only talking about ethical dilemmas because they don't have anything better to talk about. This will give them really the formal model of, of how to resolve this issue of, uh, of safety. So I, I'm ending here. What is underlying it, which I did not describe, is, is significant mathematical formalisms and proofs and artificial intelligence, but it's not the kind of artificial intelligence that you are used to here, the machine learning type of artificial intelligence. It's the rule-based artificial intelligence, how to take human judgment and codify it in a set of definitions and, and rules. And surprisingly, it can be done. It is not, not something that needs data-driven approaches. Thank you.